This is Talking Mojo. Filmmaker, iPhone cinematographer, mobile film of the year 2020 by USA Mobile Movie Magazine. Hey Mikey, what are you doing there? Carl, I'm just, I'm on gofilmit.tv uh, and it's Cassius Rayner. He's an award-winning uh, mobile filmmaker. And you know, the best thing is he, he's in the UK. So I found this, this amazing f- uh, series called The World Full Silent. And I'm, I'm especially interested in London Full Silent. Well, there certainly is London as I've never experienced it before. I've been to London many, many times, been out in London at night many, many times. I've never seen it looking as empty as that and feeling as sad as that. Let's meet the filmmaker then uh, behind that film and so many others. He is Cassius Rayner. Cassius, thank you for joining us on uh, Talking Mojo. When did you film uh, London's Fall Silent. When, when did you capture those images we just saw? Um, I started capturing them the day we went into lockdown, uh, the first one, March. It was around March 23rd, I think, is when I started. And the thing that strikes me about the, the film particularly, you know, we're always warned, aren't we? Mobile devices, small sensors, it gets difficult when you've got low light situations. But on that film we've just seen, the, the quality you're getting in low light situations is incredible. So let, let's talk a little bit about the, some of the kit you're using there. What, what, what camera are you using to pick up those images? Uh, well, I was shooting on the iPhone 11 Pro uh, and I was using uh, a piece of software called Filmic Pro. I think the Filmic Pro app is, is most definitely designed towards those that are already in that world of filmmaking or you know, mojos that have some some kind of formal training uh, on camera. It's, I mean, it was designed by a filmmaker themselves, and so they were thinking for filmmakers about how do we use the phone as a tool to, to actually shoot good quality with. So with all that in mind, that's very much the interface, I think, behaves in that way, that it tries to give you as close to the operation that you would expect from a DSLR camera. So your exposure, your white balance, you know, to be able to have as much manual control as you possibly can. You could could have shot that on any camera and it's all about how you interpret that kind of emotion, the feeling of the the story you're trying to tell. And uh, it it is incredible that these devices are capable of that. just talk us a little about a bit about the kit. I mean, don't go into too much detail because we've heard it. We've heard it everywhere else, haven't we? We can go on on, on other other social media um, uh, accounts of ours, um, especially yours, Cassius, and you can see precisely what you use. But just talk us through a bit about the the basic kit. Is there external extra lenses? Um, are you using a, a log setting in the cinema pack of of Filmic? Those kind of things, and maybe some of the grip. Um, well, specifically for London Full Silent, um, I kept the kit as minimal as possible because I wanted to be, pardon the pun, as mobile as possible. Um, I actually, to, to give some perspective on it at the time, because obviously we were in major, major lockdown, so the streets were literally empty. I mean, there were a few bodies floating around, but not many. I, I had volunteered, I, I, I desperately need, needed to do something because my work was put on hold as well and I needed to be involved and help. So I actually was a, a frontline um, worker, so I volunteered and I was delivering uh, food parcels and medicines to families uh, that were in, in isolation. And it was during those journeys driving around London that I felt 
I would be mad to not capture this with my mobile phone. So kit wise, um, I had a mobile phone, obviously. Uh, I had a Smooth 4 gimbal. I particularly like using the Smooth 4 gimbal because it integrates with Filmic Pro and the it's the only gimbal that has a, a focus wheel actually on the side of the handle. So I can actually control my manual focus um, without having to touch the phone screen. Um, and obviously I had the Filmic Pro app installed. Um, I'm trying to think, I didn't use any external lenses uh, for that entirety of the filming that I did. Any any filters at all? Any ND filters or anamorphic lenses? Anything just? Well, I mean, for the night shoots, obviously, uh, no. But during the day, yes, I did on occasion on a c couple of shots because of the white sky. And I was trying to get a little bit of contrast into the sky. I did use an ND32, which I just clipped over the lens. Amazing. And I, I want to I wanna second the Smooth 4. I have, I have the Smooth 4. I also have a, for my um, Fuji mirrorless camera, I have a Ronin. And um, comparing the two in terms of workflows, people, people do ask, don't they, about the workflows and how we can benefit with mobile. It, within seconds, I have, I have my iPhone in the Smooth 4 gimbal and I'm pull focusing, I'm moving, I'm capturing. On the, on the Ronin and my, my Fuji, depending on what lens I put on, uh, I have to balance it, I've got to calibrate um, the, the X and Y axis and, and it does slow it down, those kind of uh, more complex uh, rigs. Yeah, most, I mean, most definitely, and it really depends on the situation that you're in, um, about how fast you can work. I mean, that was the one thing that appealed to me about kind of n not sort of converting wholly to mobile phone, but it was the, the route that I ended up taking. And it was just the fact that that process of setting up was just so much quicker. And I wasn't reliant on a team of people to join me that I could actually set it up and shoot myself um, in, 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 you know, and, and, and during that time I have filmed in very hostile situations in, in different countries and, and the mobile phone has, has really, really helped me with, with that process. Um, and in some ways has actually kept me safer, I think, than, than if I had turned up with a huge camera on my shoulder. You're less of a target, aren't you, for anybody that's around you. We'll, we'll come on to uh, some of those other topics, maybe about the workflows and, uh, and the gear. But, you, you know, Cassius, I care so much about the, the sound and uh, the music tracks for all the videos uh, that I watch uh, and enjoy. I actually watched London Fall Silent twice. I first watched it, but we do a lot of second screening at the, work, at the moment, don't we? We all sit with the telly on and you know, you've know got the phone and the iPad in your other hand. So I watched it with the, without the sound. Wow, very impressive. Then I went into another room and I watched it again. Where do you source your, your music? Because the, the power of that film for me is, okay, you've, you've captured those images, where does the music fit into the workflow for you? Do, are you hearing the music before you start? Have you a library and you know you're going to be using X, Y, Z as part of a particular project? Or are you literally finding what works, you know, as the latter stage of the process? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, um, a lot of people do inquire about that. Um, I kind of already know a sound and a sense and a feeling and an emotion that I want to get from it. I think what I put into my actual filming is my own emotions. So I, I feel and sense it while I'm actually filming. And I already have some kind of sense of a, of a piece or a sound that I, I feel works with the movement. And when I'm actually filming, I tend to already have something in my head and that dictates the way I move with the gimbal and the pace that I move at. Um, do I have it complete? No. And I spend a long time afterwards in the post-production trying to uh, find the right piece that fits into some sounds that I had in my head originally. I mean, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's just kind of the way my head works is that I don't have a specific piece in my head or I haven't heard it at that point when I go out filming, but I do have a sense of the sound that I feel when I'm actually filming and that's what I then seek out afterwards. And are you actually, um, uh, uh, people often say to me, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to find music to illustrate what I'm, what I'm capturing. 
Um, yes, there are lots of royalty-free uh, clips and, and stuff online. Are you using that or are you, you spending money on finding better quality music for your projects? Um, well, I, I think as an indie filmmaker, I kind of gone down the same route as everyone else. Uh, I, in the past, you know, I, I mean, I've got good relationships with individual composers and on, on occasion we'll work together on different projects if the budget allows it. But in most cases, um, I do use uh, libraries online. So I will go to different uh, companies and actually search their, their huge database that sometimes drives me mad because there's just so much to search. Um, but there is a specific one that I've, in in the last year or so, I've been using and I've always been incredibly happy um, with what they produce and there are some certain artists that they have and I just absolutely love their style. Um, and so I'm fairly confident I can always find the piece that I want from that specific site. Um, quick question, do you, before we go on to some of the other clips, and I want to look at the workflows with Mikey, uh, uh, specifically about your workflows uh, in relation to a question that we've had that, that's come in uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, do you think of yourself as a journalist in any way or just as a documentary filmmaker? So, uh, yeah, OK, that's a really good question. Um, if, if you just said, do you think of yourself as a journalist, I would say no. Um, and I think that just comes down to how one is formally trained. So, you know, over 20 years ago, my training was in film production. And so you kind of are set in that mindset of, of being a filmmaker. Um, I guess my passion for documentaries has always been there. And the more that I've gone into the documentary world, um, I still actually would think of myself as a filmmaker and, and not specifically a journalist um, but I think obviously those two things do cross over. So in a minute we're going to look at a couple of clips that personally again it depends what you mean by mobile journalism but the clips coming shortly I think show that there is a strong journalistic flair in so much of what you do uh, but we'll do that just after we've talked about the workflow. So Mikey the workflow for producing films Mikey does so much literally on the iPhone and an iPad using uh, Filmic and then bouncing stuff across into uh, LumaFusion. Um, are you doing the same or are you then jumping to a bigger device for part of the production process? So I want to kind of hand over to you and Mikey to discuss that really. I mean generally uh, I will work on a bigger device. So in, in my studio uh, with the footage I, I uh, personally work on um, Final Cut Pro X um, but when I'm on location, so when I've been overseas on, on documentaries, um, I can use one as an example. I was part of an elephant rescue in South America uh, where they were sending the elephant off to uh, a sanctuary in, deep in the jungle in Brazil. And so I had my iPad with me and it was at times like that, having access to LumaFusion um, and being able to transfer the Filmic Pro footage straight into the iPad, one, two, tech you know just to check the daily rushes just to make sure that i was on task with the footage that we needed um, and also luma fusion allowed me to create some edit workflows and also send back some sequences and samples back to uh, the mothership or the, the main company back in america so they were kind of on board all the way through and that was a really helpful process and i do use that on occasions um, but generally, if I'm based in the UK and I'm working from the studio, I generally would come back and put it onto the Final Cut Pro X. I think there's two two different ways, as as Cassius uh, just alluded to. You you've got a pre-planned production of which you you will separate into you know the the, the production or the filming of, and then the post-production. And if there is that time, then of course you want to be in the best environment with the with, with the best kit that you've got to hand and if you are if you are coming back if i'm doing anything with which is a little bit more less time dependent then i i will i'll film things on on the on the on the phone or even a mirrorless camera or dslr and then take that back and combine that onto onto an fcpx um edit um 
platform like like, like Cassius is doing. Um, but in the world of news and linking back to Klaus, who put on our on our question on the question on the YouTube channel, he was asking about workflows and and um, and what kind of basic kit for. Uh, I think he's in in Austria uh, for some some broadcaster. Um, when I'm working in news and it's a quick, fast turnaround, we've always, for years, been sh shooting on big, big cameras with with the laptops, the, the MacBooks with FCPX on. Um, but as the kit's improving and it's getting more portable, then journalists are able to take their iPhone, whether it's an iPhone 8 or or, or 11 or or a new 12 and they can edit um, on the on location very easily even on that device itself using luma it's a little bit awkward because it's uh, it's a bit small so i have been i've been playing around with the with the ipad pro and um it's just as it's as simple as you you, you film you airdrop that footage onto the ipad you can then import that into luma fusion do your edit and then export that in, in various states. You can export just the audio. If it's a radio piece, you can export the video. If it's TV uh, or, or, or social media. And you've also got the stills function. You can take some screenshots if you didn't have time to take any um, uh, purposeful, um, you know, uh, environmental portraiture photos using the camera itself. Um, and then obviously, depending on the broad broadcaster in news, you will be sending it back with their their platform so um, uh, we, we will send at the BBC back via a BBC application and uh, it will go to every single site that you tell it to go to and every radio station so the workflow now is really quick from from acquisition to uh, display back at back at a base it can be a matter of minutes depending on what you're what you're sending back but if you're crafting something long form you do need to go back to that studio post-production facility, whether it's whether it's in in your bedroom or or in an, in an office space, uh, uh, and really be be um, be absorbed by by the pictures and the sound it, it, with, with the proper displays and the proper um, studio monitors. Um, but these iPads and, and the mobile edit, it's absolutely fantastic, and and uh, I totally endorse Luma Fusion um, off the back of uh, Filmic Pro. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Okay, so Cassius is going to um, make some uh, predictions about the future and give us his, 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 his opinions about the future shortly. But let's see another couple of clips of his work before we go uh, any further. And these are the clips I was alluding to a few minutes ago that for me have a very strong flavour of journalism uh, and news. So let's see them and then we'll do some more chat. All the uh, bloody gets to you and it really does. Times like this, in this crisis. Sorry, I'm getting a bit, uh, a bit touched by it all. Uh, down at Lewisham Hospital, all the nurses and doctors and all the healthcare workers and everyone that works in the hospital came outside and all the police lined up. Just amazing, amazing, amazing moment of solidarity. Again, the power of the music is so clear on that, that second clip. Cassius, th let's talk about the first one though. Um, a rare time when you turn the camera on, on yourself and you were visibly uh, moved by what was happening uh, around you. Why did that particular moment strike such a chord with you? That, that's, it's really difficult to, to answer that. It, it, yeah, it's not something I would normally do. Um, I think I was just engulfed by it all at that point. Um, we were all, as a, as, a, as a nation, experiencing something we, we've never experienced in our lifetimes before. Um, I felt it was important to have the human, uh, the human impact, the human effect of it. And I've 
filmed in different situations where I've had to keep a very straight face or I've not, you know, I have to disconnect emotionally. Um, and I guess this time it just felt very personal for me and I was just overwhelmed in the emotion at that point and I wasn't even sure in the edit whether I was going to put that in or whether I was just going to keep that out of the equation and then I thought no it's about time to actually show show how it has an impact on the filmmaker as well that it's you know it's we're not all cold fish and we just you know we're not affected by what, what we're experiencing or seeing and so it was important to me to I mean I'm kind of putting myself out there <laughs> And that wasn't easy to do, um, or, or to to show to to many viewers my my emotions. But I thought it was important to show that to everyone and say, you know, Christ, we're all human, and this 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 is a hard time. I, I think everyone can relate to. Sorry, Carl. Uh, everyone, everyone, everyone watching that would re relate to it. They, 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 they would have felt exactly how you felt, and and I capturing that those same moments um, for 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 the BBC, it was emotional, and you just felt like wow, this this is this is something that we we may never experience in our lifetime again. Um, it, it was really, it was almost like our war. You know, it's our war time. This. The thing for me about that clip as well, Mikey, is that, you know, if a, if a news reporter had stuck a microphone, you know, a gun mic underneath somebody uh, to get a clip from them, they wouldn't have got what Cassius got when he turned the camera on himself, because it's just so much more personal, isn't it? So for me, it's a very strong journalistic flavour to, to, to you were kind of offering up your, your emotions on that very personal level. And then that other clip, the Black Lives Matter uh, protest there. I mean, again, we've all seen lots of Black Lives Matter on, on our news programmes, but I have rarely seen it in a way that it moves me as much as it did with, again, the music you were using there. And that idea of in being in black and white and morphing back into colour, again, was that an idea that you went out with or did you just adopt that in post-production afterwards? Uh, no, it was something that was in my head at the time. I made a de I, I made a decision to shoot in black and white because I felt that it was a representation of, of the issues that we were dealing with and and still continue to deal with. And I wanted to then obviously turn it to color because I had this word in my head about united being united, and so I felt. To me, the, the end of the film uh, needed to represent that, to turn, not everything in life is black and white. And, you know, to go into full colour was just a, a very personal uh, input for me and in, in how I felt at that time. So let me just ask Mikey a question here. So uh, Mikey works at the BBC. Uh, he basically spends huge amounts of his week uh, working with news journalists on a news programme. Would the BBC journalists and the BBC producers and editors have done that with a Black Lives Matter story ever or, or not, Mikey? We're seeing now a bit of a change in the way um, these broadcasters like the BBC are actually telling stories. I think um, we, we, are, we are seeing more self-authored pieces like, like Cassius would go and film um, a, in a documentary style. Um, we used to always have that formulaic, you know, you start with the, the action shots, then there's a piece to camera, then there's the interview, and then there's another piece to camera and, and a kind of summary. But I think um, we, we've, we have this last year uh, especially been experimenting um, with, with quite a different way of telling stories. And, and uh, I, I worked with a, a colleague, uh, Usman, who will get on the show. He's, he's over at Netflix at the moment in, in Bristol doing some film uh, film series and um, we uh, we we told his story he told his own story as a self-authored piece during Black Lives Matter and we also um, had four other case studies oh, there was four in total sorry um, of, of all walks of life uh, telling their story and um, we found that using these smaller devices uh, you were really able to get into that personable um, place with them where they they just opened up and they they didn't feel like there was a big film crew there and I, I, I really believe that that, that mobile journalism um, and mobile filmmaking has a big 
future in the way that we tell our audiences what what's going on and what is real what is happening out there um, it is really i don't know cassie so if you found that we're, when you're with these mobile phones to really opens up to to some sound bites that you probably wouldn't have got with big film equipment oh I, 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 absolutely i mean it, 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 mobile filmmaking for me is, has allowed me to get incredibly personal with stories but i think what I also find psychologically I find interesting with a mobile phone is we just naturally feel a lot more freer with it and I have in recent times been turning the phone more on myself and, and not because I've got some kind of big ego but I just because I have something to say as a filmmaker in, in what it is that I'm doing and I, and I think that personal approach um, makes a huge difference and I think I think audiences want that now I think you know if there were more journalists out there that were able and I don't know the setup in that world but if they were able with their mobile phones to to interject their own their own actual personality and their own their own feelings about things I, I, I think the power of that is would be quite extraordinary. That is something really sorry Carla just just that that's really hit hit home locally in in BBC Yorkshire um we had a a reporter um uh, Kathy who who lost both the parents very quickly during during covid and she told her story she had documented it herself and she you know she'll she'll she, 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 the, the 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 kind of impact that had on our audiences they were blown away that these people are real too they're experiencing these real life situations that that everyone out there are, are feeling and and telling their that telling their story as a journalist was uh, was really really moving and powerful and it, it opened up that level of engagement with 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 our audiences and uh, I, I definitely think you're right Cassius if if we can try and shift towards those more personal moments and like 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 we've said the these bits of kit um uh, the mobile kit is is really uh, i think that is the stepping stone to that kind of uh, way of telling stories this leads us i think beautifully into our next clip so every journalist wants to tap in to the emotion of a story it is that that connects with other human beings as they listen to a story or they they watch someone speak so Cassius, just, just set up this next clip for us. The incredibly emotional stories uh, from men uh, talking about their, their struggle with um, children being severely ill and losing children to uh, ill health. Just, just talk us about that, that uh, documentary series. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the charity approached me um, and we, we had several conversations and of course, they're a fantastic charity that support families um, at the Evelina Children's Hospital. And they support the parents and the families and, and it's an integral part um, uh, that, that, that's necessary in the NHS to have that support. And I felt personally, for, for personal reasons, I felt very strongly about it and I wanted to, to help. And I felt the mobile phone was the best way to approach the story. The issue around the UK was that um, men in particular, they were finding men in particular, were not engaging with the networks. They were not asking out for support. They were bottling up their emotions about their children going through what they had to go through in hospital and in, in sadly in some cases where their children had passed away. Um, and, and it, it hit me personally and I wanted to find a way to tell that story and so I drove around the country <laughs> with my mobile phone and one light and a, and a, a cheap uh, 15 pound lapel microphone uh, and a piece of black cloth so I could uh, create a blank background to the interviews um, so that we could really really concentrate on the men and on how they were going to open up or not open up I didn't know at that time if, if they would but they did because it felt much more of a one-to-one -one, um, that they were just having a conversation with me and 
the organic development of that in the interviews were far exceeded anything that I, ha I had planned. And I think when the charity screened it at the hospital with lots of doctors uh, and professors, they'd never seen anything on this level before. And it was a huge insight for them to try and understand more about men being fathers and, and what they go through when they're in the hospital. Let's see what I think is a very powerful example of what you've just said. Here's the clip. The one bit I would certainly say is don't hold it in because I'm now, what, five years on and my wife doesn't know this. I haven't told her. And it feels like I'm lying to her when I say that I'm okay. And there's occasions where I break down when I talk to anybody about it and have to stop and just sort of think you know what no that didn't happen we're now here find a way of allowing it to let go so the point about that is that he's telling you something he hasn't even told his wife I mean you, you can't really get more personal and intimate than that can you no no and I, I, I feel I, I had formed my own relationships with with all of them because they were so amazing to open up to me and so that that made it important to me to to be human about how I was going to represent them and so they they were you know involved all the way through it and I always made sure I checked with them whether they were they were okay with certain clips being shown and they were incredibly strong um, and that they desperately wanted other, other fathers to, to know and understand that they're not on their own. And it was, just, it was just important. So it was, yeah, it was an incredible journey and one I was very emotionally and do, affected do you by. Think you got, do you think you got, sorry to interrupt you, do you, th I'm just trying to bring it back to the, the whole idea of the, the tech. And you know, here you are, a, 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 a filmmaker who is now only using uh, mobile technology to capture your material. Did you get to that point because the equipment is different, because it's not an entire film crew and it's you and a mobile and a light. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that has, that has a huge impact on, on what you get from interviews. I mean, I, I would say through experience of just using mobile phones um, in the last few years of, of doing many, many different types of interviews, I've always got more out of those interviews than I know I would have had if I'd used a professional camera setup, if I had a separate sound recordist and a boom operator and someone fiddling with the lights. Um, I just would not have got what I got. And I do think mobile phone is integral to, to that aspect of filmmaking. The, 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 biggest thing, the biggest thing for me is, um, and again, kind of linking it back to how we tell stories, how we tell these personal stories is, it was so simple. You know, there's no distractions, as you mentioned, the, the black cloth. Um, there, was no, there was no other kind of shots uh, that, that overlaid those, those interviews to, to just really, you, you, you were homed in on, the, on the, their eyes. You could see the emotion, you could see, could see the the just the way that they really felt and you were listening to them engaged with them and um, I think I think sometimes the, those sim simple basic um, skills that you that you've acquired um, over the years as, as a filmmaker sometimes it the simple is is the best yeah I I, I really think it is Mike I mean the, the, the you start getting fancy with it with interviews and it disrupts it disrupts the flow it makes them self-aware of what's going on around them um and and i think to me that really fails the objective of of getting the story and getting as deep as you possibly can um within reason but i think that's why i kept it very blank one light you know, literally a little video LED light, very small, um, you know, it, not brilliantly lit, but that wasn't to me important. What was important was what that person was saying. And I wanted the audience to be really honed in on that person, to feel like they were actually in the room sitting there opposite them. And that mobile phone technology, I felt 
is what works. That's what works in that environment. Absolutely, it's, it's it's just amazing. It's amazing. Before we move on to that next clip, I just want I want people to understand though that uh, you you know although we're talking about just being a, a, as simple and stream streamlined as you can, you know, we we can we can when the story needs we can we can have sound sound operators boom operators we can have external audio devices extra lenses uh, full film crews this is just a way of capturing it, it's just a camera um, and, and more than more so it's a connected camera we can film on it and 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 wirelessly send stuff back we can be live whether it's the the, the kind of um, domestic side of things with with Facebook or, or Instagram or Twitter, uh, but, but but broadcasters can use these phones um, as live um, outside broadcast cameras. You know, we we use them, we use them over COVID. We've used them. Um, we we have a Anna Holligan who's over in uh, in the Netherlands who works for uh, the news channel um, uh, network news. She does all her reports on her own with a with a mobile phone live. Um, they are a lot more than just a basic camera kit. But I think what we're trying to highlight here is that basic fundamentals of how cinema works, how how filming people and telling stories through through th th this medium. It's, that is the most crucial bit, understanding what, when, why, and how. Should we just, just take 30 seconds to, to, to hear from Cassius on, on how important those basic um, cinema skills are? Sure, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you, Mike. Um, I think um, using a mobile phone to, to produce really good quality video and audio, which it's capable of doing now. Um, I, I think there's a bit of a myth around it, well, what I have experienced, in, 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 and also when I've lectured and trained others, is that the mobile phone just creates all the magic. And, uh, and then they're always frustrated and angry when they come back and say, well, it was awful under low light and it did this and it was glitching and it wasn't get, capturing this. And I thought you just could do this and it would be amazing. And, you know, the fundamental is, is that it is just a tool and it's a tool that I personally prefer to, to, to work with, but it is um, a tool and it is a camera and basic training is essential. You need to get training. You need to get that fundamental training. What I do is not magic. I mean, a lot of people online go, wow, how did you do that with a mobile phone? Well, it's not, it's, it's not the mobile phone. It's the skill that goes behind it. It's the training. It's the discipline. It's having structure to what it is that you're doing. And I think for myself being trained in film production so many years ago, of course, and, and, and gained experience, then that what, that's what makes me personally uh, drive my work and, and that's what people see. But they think that it's the phone that does it and it's not, it, it's your skills and how you develop that, that makes the difference. Um, and, I, and I hope that we get over that um, issue that I think is, is there at the moment. Um, and I, I don't introduce myself as a, DSLR camera operator or a, hi I'm a 35mm uh, filmmaker um, but I'm still stuck in that world where people say oh Cass the mobile filmmaker well I am just a filmmaker but I happen to use mobile as a tool so I hope that at some point in the future we get beyond that labeling and we are just listed as filmmakers if that makes sense. The portability is such an important point, isn't it? And that's what comes across to me, I think, in this next little clip that we're going to screen. So this is from something called uh, Heart Warriors. Let's look at the clip and then uh, we'll talk about it in a moment. So the way you're capturing those people doing extraordinary things, saving children's lives, 
is by going into places like operating theatres. So you got your scrubs on for that uh, piece of work, didn't you, Cassius? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Where was that? Uh, Ethiopia. So what was what was the what were you what was that commission? What, that was a commission, was it, or was that more charity work? Just explain that that project. Uh, without going into great detail. Um... In 2014, my daughter was taken into hospital and had to have open heart surgery. And she was in hospital for about four months and we lived with her in the hospital. We got to know Professor Qureshi very, very well and he was very much looking after our daughter. And if, if, if I can say this, he saved her life. And you feel pretty useless um, as, a, as, a, as a parent because you are not in control of the situation. And so I felt, well, I have a skill I'm a filmmaker, what can I do to, to help the amazing work that they're doing here, and particularly with the NHS? So I started talking to Professor Qureshi and then realized that he was doing a lot of work overseas, volunteering himself and medical teams to save as many children as possible in, in all sorts of different climates. And I thought, wow, why, why is this story not being told? Why is this not? And I thought this was my opportunity to give something back. And so I discussed it with him and the Chain of Hope, which is this large scale UK charity. And um, they allowed me to come on board. So I went over there as a medical volunteer because the key was that um, if I'd gone in there with camera equipment and all the re regular gear and my lenses, um, the, the army security at the airport, there's no way they would have let me through. They would, I would have been sent back on the next aeroplane or even, you know, taken taken into custody. Um, so the fact that I could go in as part of their team with my mobile phone in my bag, um, and I wasn't carrying anything that made it look like, you know, that it was suspicious or that it was uh, more than it was than just being, you know, a, a tourist or, you know, that kind of ilk. So, yeah, um, so that's the, how the I mobile, got in. That mobile technology, the, the mobile technology there, enabled this story which was so important to you and i think that uh, to, to to hear to hear that that story from you i think uh, um it, it 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 shows it shows what kind of what kind of guy you are and uh, you know all all these all these films that we've seen and all the this the, the, these emotions that you've you've been able to capture i think that 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 is clear clear to see that you it means a lot to you um but do you, do you think you would not have been able to tell that story without mobile tech? Oh, no, no. I mean, it, I mean, they'd been going into Ethiopia for a long time um, to this um, very run-down medical centre where they were seeing, you know, 300 children a day, uh, trying to assess them, trying to work out how many they could operate on. And it wasn't being documented apart from photographs and maybe a couple of very shaky mobile video clips where, bless them, they're trying to do it themselves. And I just felt, well, I have the skill to, to take that to the next level. I can come in with a mobile phone. Um, we're not gonna end up with any security issues. I'm with the team. And they just welcomed me with open arms in that situation. And I had complete freedom um, of the medical center and, and all the amazing teams that were out there. And when, and when that, um, the, the man who saved your daughter's life saw what you had produced, what, what was his reaction? He's a very cool cookie. He's very calm and collect. He doesn't, he doesn't show a lot. I mean, the, the documentary is actually still in post-production. Um, there's a lot that we've had to add to it. I've had to do a lot of other interviews because I wanted the story to be one about what was happening overseas and, and the work that they were doing. But I also wanted to tell Professor Qureshi's story. I wanted... I want the nation and the audience to know who he is and what he's done because his work has been extraordinary and, and unrecognized at this point. So that was kind of driving me as well. So there is an interview where he opens up and he's clearly very emotional about things. And so you really get that sense of the human aspect. And again, being on a mobile phone with just myself and him in a room, he let his guard down and he opened up to me and that was an amazing moment for, for me. Um, and I, the trailer he has seen and he has seen some clips um, and it, he feels it's really important and he, he just uh, utterly respects what it is that I'm trying to do and put together. In, is, is, so is Heart Warriors, is it, is it gonna be a, a one part 
documentary or is, is there a few parts to it? It's, it's a, one, a one special documentary. Um, um, how, just for people who are interested, you know, who are keen uh, more, more on the kind of, this is a, a, a documentary shot in difficult environments. You, you, you've explained that, how difficult that was to be there emotionally and, and technically. Um, this is, a, this is going to be a documentary, how long shot on a phone? Well, I'm aiming for 25 minutes. So it would be something that I hope will fit into a 30-minute slot for a documentary, yeah. Incredible. And are you, have you got any, any um, sort of outlets lined up? Are you in negotiations with any? Uh, no, I mean, my, I, I'm not too... Because I'm doing this off my own back, this specific documentary I'm doing off my own back, I'm not too concerned uh, as to as to where it will go. But I do have a mission on where I'm going to make sure it does go, which is I want it to be used in the medical world um, in, and within the NHS. And I have been talking to some very senior individuals about this documentary being shown to all the trainees and all the junior doctors. Um, and I think it's an important story. It's a human story and it's a medical story. And so they hope that it will actually be a great learning curve for those that are coming into the NHS at this point. Um, and obviously I'd like to personally get it out to a few festivals around the world. Um, and, you know, we'll just take it from there as to, as to where it will go or not go. Incredible work. Shall we finish by talking about, uh, it, it is incredible. We look forward to um, it, it'll be either it or some clips will be on YouTube for us to see, won't they, Cassius, at some point? Oh, I'm sure, yes, I'm sure they will. They'll be pinging yep. around all yep. over the place. Yeah, <laughs> That's, again, another great YouTube, thing with mobile on... phones. <laughs> yeah. So technology. Let's end thinking about technology. One of the points that's come across in a really strong way in the last 45 minutes is that, yes, it's great to, to have the tech. The tech is not going to, in itself, turn you into a fantastic cinematic uh, filmmaker or, or, or even a journalist. You've got to know how to use the tech. But the tech certainly helps. And I certainly get excited about the quality of the, the pictures, the moving pictures, the still pictures, and, of course, the audio. Um, what I want to hear from you is where do you think the tech is going? I want to uh, know what a prediction is, but what I'd like you to do is just tease us a little bit, but save the bones of your prediction, write it down and put it in a sealed envelope, and we will come back to you at the point where you believe this prediction will come to fruition. And we'll open the envelope together and see if you were, were right. So just, just tell us where you think things are heading. Um, I think... I think uh, I, I definitely think that AI uh, bokeh um, is going to be the next stage in video recording on mobile phones. I think I kind of think I know that it, the technology is already there and it's just about as to when it gets released. But I think that's an area that a lot of developers are looking at, which is um, how AI can get very close to creating that depth of field and that bokeh effect that we kind of want um, as filmmakers. I'm not saying that it's necessary, but for me, I think technology-wise, that's definitely where it's going. Um, I think now that we've now gone to 10-bit uh, in log capture, 10-bit recording um, with the latest iPhone, um, I will I say that there's certainly going to be some more development in that area. Um, and I hope that tone mapping will be under control. <laughs> Maybe that's my own wish or want. But I do think they're listening, developers. Um, and I'm hoping that tone mapping will be able to be switched on and off. I hope whenever you predict that to happen, Cassius, it, it does come true because I know it, even that you're in full manual control of what you think is is that camera, the the tone mapping suddenly comes in and you think, hang up, have I left auto exposure on? Or you know, it gives that kind of unusual uh, adjustment of, of of light within within the shadows and and, and and the highlights, doesn't it? Yeah, and particularly on the iPhone 12 Pro, it's really showing itself on that one. More, It's been around a long time, tone mapping, um, and I understand the reason for the technology. It's, you know, mobile phones were spe are specifically for the general public, you know, to have 
fun and and allow this AI to create the best quality image for them. But of course, a lot more creatives around the world and a lot more professionals like myself are now coming into that world. I think the developers, I can pretty much with confidence say the developers are taking that seriously and they are looking into that area as to how can that balance be there for the creatives, filmmakers, mojos, you know, journalists who are working with that technology. How can we get that balance? So any other detail, save it for the paper, sign it, fold it up, put it in an envelope, and we look forward to coming back to you at the said time so we can open it up and find out whether your prediction has, has come true. It's been great to spend uh, so much time with you. We'd like to just end by saying, you know, what's clear is you're, you're a huge fan of that app that you found whilst, you know, using your phone while sitting in a, uh, a hospital ward one day. Uh, so Filmic Pro, you are a teacher of this app. And the tutorials are there and people can go and enjoy them online, yeah? Yeah, you can check them out on Filmic Pro's YouTube channel. Um, there's some episodes up there. It's, the, the key is that it's actually about mobile filmmaking. It's about using your filmmaking skills but in the mobile world and how you use the mobile phone with, with obviously the add-on of Filmic Pro, which just finishes it off nicely for you, hopefully. <laughs> Fantastic. Do, do you do, do any of your tutorials for those? You know, we, we we said how important it is for the basics. Is there any tutorial that you you you've, you've produced or you'd recommend for those people listening or watching this this podcast, uh, thinking you know I, I get I get it now. I've tried just to get it out of the box and press press record and and it didn't make a, an epic film. Um, I need some I need some basic knowledge of filmmaking. What would you recommend, or is there anything that you can point us to? Sure, I would. I would certainly recommend. I would say the the episodes I do is pre, is 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 kind of the next level. It's not it's not an entry level. It's for you to already have some understanding of Filmic Pro and how it operates to then look at the filmmaking skills that you complement with that. Um, so I would certainly recommend um, Epic Tutorials. Um, by Elliot, who also works uh, for Filmic Pro, but he's done a whole series uh, of really, really simple videos that goes through the whole interface of Filmic Pro. And what I like about his videos is they're not visually exciting, and but that's not the purpose. The purpose is, is that if there's certain aspects you don't understand, there'll always be a specific video about it. If you don't understand the shutter speed or the ISO, there are two different videos for it. So you don't have to keep watching huge lengthy videos just to find the bit you want. He's broken it down into multiple sections, which is great. And once you've done that, then come up and step up and watch the episodes that I'm doing with Filmic Pro and hopefully that will drive you and give you some energy and excitement to you know take it to that level. So if you haven't found Cassius on YouTube yet it's really easy to find him. We'll put up a caption right now telling you how to find him on YouTube. It has been fantastic talking to you. Uh, Cassius Rayner award-winning mojo filmmaker. I am going to call you a mojo filmmaker because for me there is so much journalism in what you're doing. I know you don't say that but for me there is. Um, it's been great having you as a guest here on Talking Mojo. Much appreciated. Thank you. Been a real pleasure.